Pendragon started out as a totally abstract prototype. So one of our designers, uh, Tom Kale, wanted to make a game where there was no... He wanted to make a game where there was no randomness, where everyone could see all the information they needed all the time, and it was just about strategy. It was He wanted to make a really hardcore, pure strategy game, and it was mostly just for fun, really. It was just a project. So we built this this two-player board game that was a bit like chess, but like a kind of simple version of chess, two players facing off against each other and, and playing this game. And we got it to a point where we liked it and it, it made for an interesting game and it was fun to play. And then we were talking about it and we said, well, you know, Inkle makes narrative games. That's what we do. So we can't ship this game. We've got this lovely game, but we can't do anything with it unless we could, unless we could somehow make it tell a story. But that's ridiculous. You can't make chess tell a story. So that seemed like something that was worth trying to do um, because we didn't know how to do it. We thought it was probably impossible, so let's give it a go. Uh, so that was kind of the start of it, actually, was was quite a technical question of how do you get a game which plays like chess to create a story as you play? And that got us onto this idea of a game where the pieces talk to each other and argue with each other as they move across the board and, and respond to what you, the player, are doing. Um, and I guess out of that, that kind of attached itself to this Arthurian setting, which is something I've wanted to write for a while anyway. And it and it sort of snowballed from there. Yeah, which is unusual for us. Most of our games, we start with a sense of, you know, who's the character? What are they doing? You know, we made a game about an archaeologist. We made a game about traveling around the world. Those are all... You know, they're quite, they're narrative activities, right? They're storytelling opportunities. This is the first time we've made a game that really started with just the core gameplay, which is good, I think, because, yeah, I've wanted to make an Arthurian legend game for a long time. But I think one of the things I've always been stuck on is what does the player do? Like, are you just a knight wandering around the country doing quests? It sounds very generic. Um, Whereas doing it this way around, having that gameplay and then sort of feeding the characters onto it, actually, it wrote itself up really nicely. It came together quite quickly, actually. Yeah, I think one of the ideas that we had there was... Um, the thing about Arthurian myths is there isn't a single version of the Arthur story. Everybody says, oh, I know the story of King Arthur, but when you actually ask them about it, they've heard of this or that, and no one quite knows, like, like no one knows which sword is Excalibur, right? We all know that Arthur pulled a sword from the stone, and we all know that Arthur got a sword from the Lady of the Lake, but which of those swords was Excalibur? Or are they the same sword? Like, nobody really knows, and that's because these aren't, it isn't a story, it's a set of characters that gets told over and over and over and over again. So there isn't really one version that's right. And I think we wanted to, we saw an opportunity to make a game that was replayable, that that really used that to its advantage. So the story is, every run through of the game is a different telling of the legend of Arthur. So it's not quite so much that it's from the viewpoint of Guinevere or the viewpoint of Lancelot because that makes it sound like there's one story but different narrators it's more like you just get a completely different legend and some completely different things happen but they all they all feel like the end of arthur they all feel right um and i like that sense that that your version is just as good as the version you had next time and the version you had last time and the version that i had and every playthrough is genuinely unique like either in a big way or a little way um, but that's okay, because myths are supposed to be like that. I thought that was kind of really interesting and quite fun to play with. I think what people playing it might not realise is quite how deep the, the, the generation and the randomization of the game really goes. Every map in every place is built newly every time you play every scene that you play through some of the scenes are, are more tightly they're, they're kind of restricted in what they can do and some of them are quite wide open but but the game doesn't really have a script at all it has 
a thousand things that people can with a bit of information about when they make sense for them to say it and that might be based on who's talking or it might be based on what just happened or what someone else just said right now and the game just pulls those lines out one by one by one by one and sometimes those lines have consequences attached to them like giving you a special move or killing someone off forever or <laughs> making two people you know hate each other or whatever it is and that's it that's the only control we have as the writers of the game is just putting more and more content in and saying these are the kind of circumstances under which this particular line of dialogue makes sense and then we just let it go so when we generate a run through which has a story it really is say when i'm trying to describe how it works it's like throwing a stone down a hillside it just bounces and bounces and bounces and it always gets to the bottom in the end but we have absolutely no idea what it's going to hit along the way so which is always, it's really great when we get bug reports from people because obviously it's complicated and that it, sometimes there are little issues and the story doesn't quite fit together maybe. And people send bugs where they say, oh, I was in the marches of the White Rocks talking to the knight and he was talking about this. And I'm like, look, I have no idea where that is. <laughs> like, that's not a real place. And I have no idea what this knight was talking about. <laughs> people say, well, and he, used, he used the wrong word. And I was like, okay, fine. Um, but yeah, it, so it's it, not even that it, it plays in different ways every time. It's that there isn't a fixed playthrough of any kind in it at all. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, Rogue was one of my favorite games when I was a kid, the original text-based. The original Rogue is very clear about that. It has some deep built-in rules, which you come to understand as you play, but then everything else is just different every time. But in a way, Pendragon isn't, I don't like to talk about it as a roguelike because in a roguelike game, you every time you play, you learn more skills or you discover more secrets about the world, which help you. So you get better and better and better at this game. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that you exactly get better and better at Pendragon the more you play it. Like, it should be interesting every time you play it and always give you new and interesting situations. It's almost more like a puzzle generator than it is like a roguelike game. You never get to a point, I think, with Pendragon where you master it, where you can just annihilate the game. I think that's been really interesting in releasing it as well, is that some strategy players came and played it and said, well, this isn't like XCOM. I don't understand it. And some roguelike players came to it and said, well, I've played 10 games and I don't seem to be getting any better. But people who like uh, people who like chess have come to it and go, oh, I get this straight away. <laughs> this, is, this is a chess problem generator. That's what it is. So I guess maybe it's it's more like a chess game than it is like a roguelike, really. You know, chess is a roguelike, right? Because every time you play, you die and you have to start again. But but it, that's not really a very good <laughs> use of the word, is it? <laughs> I think like, I mean, partly I'm interested in the storytelling side of it anyway. So we wanted scenes where the dialogue wasn't just color, but content, right? So it's not just people shouting, ah, oh, I'm going to kill you. Oh, I'm going to kill you too. That's fun. And I like that it's there. But if it's all like that, then it feels very much like you didn't really need to do the dialogue or, you know, it's, it's the same as you can play a game of Uncharted quite happily. You play the gunfights in Uncharted on mute without any sound on and you don't really lose anything for not hearing them shout to each other um so that was important but i think also i love the idea that the dialogue sequences are driven by the same movement across the board so when you're talking to someone how you move your piece is expressive like if you walk right up into their face you're being aggressive if you turn diagonally then you'll put you're literally putting your sword away and they ought to respond to that like like a human being, basically. And I just think that the game doesn't always manage to reflect that precisely because, you know, there are limits to what it can do. But I think every time that it understands that, every time that you turn diagonal and a villager like calms down a little bit in response, I just think that's magic. I think that's so cool. And not enough games in general respond to those little things that the player does. Like, I can't think of the last time I played an RPG or something that noticed whether I walked up to a character or whether I walked away from them or whether I turned my back on them, you know, and I just love the idea that those things could be ways of interacting with characters in the world because they feel like they should be. 
I don't know if you remember in the very first Assassin's Creed game, they have this weird thing where if you talk to a character while you were in a conversation with them, you could still walk around within a little circle near them. And so they'd, they'd be talking and you could walk over here and you could walk up there. You could walk off because you needed to hear the dialogue because it was the plot. But it meant that you could do these, you could play the scene where you walked up to them and then when they said something, you could turn your back on them and stare out the window while you delivered a speech about something. And it was pointless and they took it out of the later game. But I really loved it because it gave me something expressive to do. But it didn't work because when I turned my back on someone, they never said, look at me when I'm talking to you. And I wish they had. Um, so it's a little bit of that. It's just a little bit of that. And doing it on a board in a turn-based way means that we can actually do that because, you know, you make a move, you've really made it, the game can look at it and understand it. I kind of thought maybe people would play three games or four games or something like that. And the numbers are, I mean, it's only been out a couple of weeks, but we've had some in the 20s, some in the 30s. I think we had one in the 60s, which is pretty dedicated. Um, and that feels to me like that's about right, I think. Like, I don't think this is a game that you're going to play a thousand times. It's not Spelunky. It's not Rogue. It's not Hades. You're not going to just play it over and over and over and over again because it's got that narrative heart to it. And when you're when you're engaging with a story... After a while, you've got it. You've got the story. You don't need to read it again. Um, so for me, the important thing about Pendragon is that it does tell a story and you can play it 10 times in a row. Whereas most games that tell a story, you play it once, that's it. You can't play it again. You never can. Um, and I think that's similar to some of the other stuff we've done. So in you know 80 days, when we released 80 days, we go around the world in 80 days. I think when we released that, we had the idea that people would go around once, they would start another journey to see that they really could go a different way. And then they would say, OK, I'm done. I've finished this. And we were really surprised to find people playing the game 10, 15, 20 times because we thought, well, are you not sick of this game yet? And they were like, no, 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 I haven't. I haven't quite absorbed enough of it. I think while, while every game of Pendragon is different and it is infinitely replayable because it won't ever repeat. I think, you know, once people have played it about maybe five, six times, I, I feel like unless they really love the challenge, they've got the story and I'm OK if they're done at that point, if they've seen what they want to see, if they've enjoyed it. Um, but some people just get really stuck on it. And, you know, some people want to move all the little character markers up to the devastating level to, to beat the game on every difficulty. And that's fair enough. That's, that's what, what people want to do. Then, then, then they should do that. That was something that we really wanted to do. And like our last game, Heaven's Vault, was a is a 20 hour adventure game that you can replay and you can play it maybe two, three times before it'll start to just keep showing you things you've already seen. That's probably it. I mean, there are people who have played it nine or 10, but I think two two is probably the right number. Having come off the back of that, we felt we really wanted to make something that catered towards people who just didn't have that much time who just, you know, just want 15 minutes to play a game. They play it, they sit down, they play it, they get through it, they're done. Um, but then they can play it again if they wanted to, rather than that kind of long-term commitment. And if it was a five-minute game, I think it would feel throwaway. So I think that kind of 40 minutes to a run feels about right. It's the length of a train journey, you know, that kind of thing. Not that anyone goes on trains anymore, but, <laughs> but if they did... <laughs> I really hope that people do 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 that. I kind of love that idea that people might think, oh, I'll just give it another go and then find that it's still got something to offer them. That's just such a lovely idea that a game could do that. I think one thing that we try to do with our games is to make sure that the art style can't date. So normally if you try and play a game from last year, it looks very old suddenly. I, I Last night I picked up Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which I haven't played since June of last year, maybe, or whenever. And still you know it's still the same game it ever was but it didn't look nearly as beautiful as i remembered like i could see that the trees were all the same tree and there was a lot more popping in and out of the environment than i remember and i was really surprised by that because i remember it looking fantastic i remember it looking flawless and actually when i played it again a year later all i saw were the flaws because that kind of high def realistic 3d art it gets old fast really really fast Whereas I think one thing that we try to do for our games is to make sure that our art styles are the kind that can't get old. 
like 80 days is going to look exactly the same in 10 years time <laughs> it's going to look just the same as it ever did Ha <laughs> ha